I have a confession to make. Uh, when I was at high school, I gave up on maths. So much so that when I planned to drop it as a subject in my final year, my mate and I cheated on our last exam by swapping our papers. That way, neither of us had to learn more than half the syllabus. We were never caught, but our karmic punishment was that when our combined knowledge got us a decent mark, our parents and teachers made both of us do maths in Year 12. <laughs> but none of that would have happened if I could have spent five minutes with my next guest. Would you please welcome one of Australia's leading mathematicians, Nalini Joshi. <laughs> welcome. welcome. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to get this up and every time I hear something I don't understand, I'm going to ring a bell and I'll ask a question. <laughs> OK. What mathematics do you do? So, you know that mathematics starts with counting and... No, you got... Yeah. Yeah? <laughs> and numbers. So, we go one, two, three, four, five, etc. Those are integers. And then when you allow yourself to do operations on integers, you get uh, sums of integers, then multiplications, uh, products of integers, and then you might get fractions. These are rational numbers. And then, <laughs> that's just the definition. By, ra by rational, you mean they can talk things through in a calm way? No, no, I'm afraid not. Right. No. So what's a rational number? Those are fractions made up of integers over integers. Uh, look, it's going to take too long. Um, <laughs> so then what do you do? What I do is I study functions that are like the number pi. In other words, pi you can't express in finite terms in terms of these previously known uh, numbers. Um, so you can't express them in terms of counting numbers or fractions uh, or anything made up of those kinds of numbers. So... D d no, does that mean it's, it's almost infinite? Like uh, there's an infinite nature, there's nothing else you could express it as? That's right. Right. So... I think I got something. OK. <laughs> right. So these functions are like pi in the sense that they can't be expressed in finite terms from previously known functions and they're therefore called transcendental functions. In the same way, pi is a transcendental number. <laughs> is, is that like a function that, like, worked really hard and then just decided to move to Byron and chill out? <laughs> no. They're not functions that meditate either. Right. But, but um, they are functions... They're transcendental in the sense that they go beyond what we used to know. Right. And these functions, just like pi, turn out to be useful in many, many different ways areas in topics like freak waves in the ocean or if you're looking at how stars get formed or if you're looking at how animals move around on uh, landscapes like mobs of kangaroos moving across the outback. All of these different areas turn out to be systems that are close to integrable systems. So that maths, what I do. So maths is the way of nutting out why kangaroos all go that way. And why stars are the way they are. Yes. Yeah, see, where were you in Year 12 <laughs> when, it, when it was all just X is this, Y is this, and I was like, I'm just going to read some Vonnegut. Yeah. <laughs> I did that too. You did that too? Yeah. So, so why is maths important? Maths is everywhere. It's an indelible part of everything we do. It's an, uh, an essential part of being human as well as being useful. So if we're talking about traffic or if we're talking about how infections spread and how Ebola should be contained or how HIV AIDS, the drugs, should be dispensed, um, all of those things require us to know something about mathematics before we can answer the questions that, that come up uh, in those particular areas. So if we're going to be making ourselves into a more progressive, modern society that relies on technology and data-driven evidence in the future, then we all need to be more sophisticated mathematical thinkers. And that's why we need to learn more maths. See, I sense that it's more passionate with you as well. Like, what does maths... You know, that's what maths means to the world. What does maths mean to you? Uh, maths, for me, is the adventure of exploring the unknown, uh, it's a dream that I have of understanding the universe, the structures of the universe. And it also is a freedom that comes from exploring things that have no boundaries or borders. So mathematics is all of those things for me. I sense that your relationship is quasi-romantic with yes. mathematics. <laughs> yes, I'm in love with it. Right. Yes. So, so when did 
maths pass you a note in class and you first realised you had a crush on it? A very long time ago, I think. Um, when I was a child in Burma, I started noticing that I loved counting. I, I loved counting, kept, kept on counting, counting, counting to bigger and bigger numbers. And then I played a lot with games and puzzles that had repeating patterns that I could try and grab a hold of. And when I was trying to make sense of the world, and there were a lot of different things happening in my life um, at that time, my father was conscripted into the army because he was from a different ethnic background to the dominant group in Burma. I was going more and more into thinking about these things, into mathematics. Mathematics became like a haven for me. And when I came to Australia and I discovered this thing called science fiction, and, um, you know, I was sure that I was going to become um, what they used to call an astrogator. <laughs> um, what is an astrogator? That's like an astronaut who navigates through space. Wow. And so why, why did you not end up doing that? Well, first of all, um, the careers counsellor at school said, well, you have to be more realistic, dear. <laughs> um, and, and then my mother said, oh, you, you should get married to an older man, a richer man, because then they'll take care of you for the rest of your life. My father said, you should become a doctor so that you can, you know, survive throughout all of the different uh, things that life throws at you. So it seems um, that you ignored all of that advice. Yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> You said you weren't of the dominant ethnic group in Burma. Mm. And, I, and I'm just curious, this was, this was after the coup in, yes. in Burma. Yes. And so what did that mean for you as a, a kid living somewhere where you weren't part of the dominant ethnic group? Well, I didn't really think about it, but looking back on it, there were many, many different signals. Um, so first of all, my father was conscripted. We had to go and live in the Golden Triangle on army bases. And the Golden Triangle is the region that supplies Australia with most of its heroin. Yes. And uh, then when we came back out of that life, um, um, there were many things we couldn't do. And my father told me later, for example, um, I used to top most of the subjects at school, in primary school, and, um, but I never got the top prizes at the end of the year because I wasn't Burmese, ethnically. Um, so there were a lot of these kinds of signals that kept on coming our way that we weren't wanted. And then you and came to Australia in the 70s, right. which would have sorted all that out. That, that I'm sure... <laughs> no, I'm afraid not. <laughs> when it comes to literacy, we read books to little kids to, to get them interested. What's, yes. what's the maths equivalent of a good bedtime story? So let me tell you the story about what happened with my children. Yes. I have two children, and um, when I started noticing the way they were going at at maths at school, I went to the teacher and I said, I'd love to help. And the teacher said, oh, no. Parents find maths very difficult. You won't like it. <laughs> um, then I said, no, I, really, I, I'll be OK at it. <laughs> and, and then I tried to give her my business card to show her that I have the skills that she might be fearing I didn't have. But then I, that was a terrible mistake to make because I never heard from them again. Um, oh, so it's, it's almost it's more it's concerning like that you would know their much. faults. Yes. Exactly, exactly. So there's a kind of an insecurity embedded in the system. There's a lack of confidence, and that comes through to all the children, I think. Um, and another part of it is that um, the way mathematics is taught quite often is a very rigid hierarchy. Um, so you have to follow these steps that the teacher tells you to follow and you can't think of it any other way. You can't collaborate with your friends. You can't find your own pathway through it. So it's like learning music where you maybe pick an instrument, you learn how to play it, you practice, 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 but you never get to the stage of actually creating your own music. Right. So when I uh, discovered that my daughter in particular was really frustrated about this happening to her about mathematics. One summer I sat down with her and I looked at her textbooks. Oh my God, they were terrible. Um, <laughs> and so I found my old textbooks from when I was at high school. And then we sat down every day over summer and we went through some of those examples. And what I tried to do was to show her that when we solved things together, I could make mistakes right. alongside her and that we could laugh about those mistakes. I should tell you that she just finished a pure maths honours degree and wow. her first job, which she got within a few months of uh, finishing her degree, was um, is with an aerospace company as a mathematician. 
Well, you are, must be the proudest parent in the world. I'm very, very happy, yes. Um, you are also, though, an activist for gender equality in yes. your field. How, how does gender affect how you experience your career? Well, I'm transparent to my gender, and so I don't think about it, but there are many, many things that happen that are related to the fact that I'm a woman. As you might know, I'm also the uh, first female professor of any of the mathematical sciences uh, appointed to Australia's oldest university, that's the University of Sydney. And I was the third female mathematician ever elected to the Australian Academy of Science. But whenever I go to functions at the academy, wearing my suit, I often get mistaken for being one of the serving staff. So like the tea lady? Well, yes, or the catering staff. You know, they go around with trays of food. So what does that make you feel when, when something like that happens? I just get bemused. I just call upon those things that I've learnt uh, to be resilient and I just smile and I point it out to people around me and we, we move on. But this is just like a little tip of the iceberg. There are many, many other things that happen in the sciences and in mathematics that comes out of... I think being very, uh, uh, many people being very insecure about what they do. And so there's a great deal of competition, very severe competition, which leads to un unhelpful behaviour, I think. And that, that means that even though there are something like 40% uh, of the undergraduates doing mathematics subjects are female in Australia, um, and something between 30 and 40% of them do PhDs in mathematical sciences, only 9% of professors are female in mathematics in Australia. So there's a very dramatic change. Yeah, sorry, that just makes no sense to me at all. Yeah. No sense at all. It doesn't make sense to me either. Well, Nalini, thank you so much for coming and help me un understand maths a little further and understanding you. I really appreciate it. Nalini Joshi, ladies and gentlemen.